Hi. So uh, yeah, pick up your prelim uh, uh, exam as well as uh, uh, print out of the solutions. Uh, and uh, if you haven't, you can do that in the end of the class again. So. Uh, and uh, just want to maybe spend a few minutes uh, talking about the uh, exam and uh, uh, some observations and maybe suggestions for the second round. Uh, 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 I, I think on an, this, was, uh, this exam is, was on the easier side uh, uh, for the class. And, uh, um, and I think uh, uh, most of you got what was being asked. And that's a good sign. Uh, uh, I would just kind of uh, go through. Uh, let's say uh, the first question was a, basically a free takeaway. Just you know, kind of tell us what what you have learned about ABCD parameters. But more specifically, ABCD parameters as applied to an optical cavity and the fact it has to self-replicate and and essentially lets you find the uh, uh, the Q parameter uh, as a function of distance and uh, tells you quite a bit of uh, information about the modes that actually fit inside a cavity. Right? It doesn't tell you anything about modes that do not fit in the cavity. Uh, so, uh, and and uh, how the beam sh sh uh, shape changes, the curvatures must match at the, the shapes of the mirrors and so on. Right? So that's what this tells us. Uh, and the second question was uh, uh, essentially about the stability of, of uh, uh, a cavity. and. Uh, uh, I would say most of you did get it, uh, uh, and uh, some of you thought probably that the question was asking something different. Uh, I would say that uh, in general, uh, I've been very lenient in grading this exam, uh, and uh, if you showed uh, 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 some steps which uh, were relevant, you've been awarded points. But nevertheless, if you think that you deserve more points, please come back and uh, see me. Okay, so, uh, and, 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 and this problem, uh, what I was, the reason kind of uh, uh, the exam was open book was you could kind of pick up a formula. There's a formula that was derived in the book, which uh, uh, you did not have to rederive. But if you, uh, some of you actually did rederive it, and that's also great. Uh, but uh, if you have uh, two uh, mirrors of a uh, 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 radii R1 and R2, and the distance is d. Uh, uh, of course, you can use the ABCD parameter and uh, derive the stability criteria for this, right? For this uh, uh, situation, and, uh, 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 and and some of you did do that. Um, basically, propagate by D, uh, uh, <coughs> and 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 then uh, reflect with the mirrors, uh, with uh, you know minus two over R and, and 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 so on, right? You 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 kind of did that. And uh, after you do all that, you have to apply the stability criteria that uh, uh, a plus d over 2, uh, uh, or ba basically, I'm going to just write the end result. The end result is uh, if one mirror has radius d r1, and the other has radius r2, then uh, uh, the stability criteria is really G1 times G2 must be between 0 and 1. Right? That's, that, that's really what it is. And, uh, uh, and because here, uh, what you have is one of them has R plus delta R and <coughs> R, sorry, R2 is R minus delta R. Uh, from here directly, you can see that if I take the product R plus delta R minus D over R minus delta R. And try to put the distance is equal to R, which is the uh, confocal distance, essentially uh, the same as the radius. Uh, if I try to do that, which is uh, uh, the initial part of the problem, uh, clearly you know, this thing is smaller than 1, and that thing is larger than 1. So this thing is negative, right? And, and uh, that's positive. So you are not between 0 and 1. I mean, that, that, that's the thing. So it's negative. So it's really in the unstable zone. And uh, uh, therefore, now you kind of want to show for what distances will it become stable. Right? And so basically, you are kind of somewhere out here in negative zone. And you, uh, so in, in, in some sense, this is the more important criteria to satisfy. Right? So the distance between the two mirrors. 
uh, uh, must be uh, this is kind of the criteria that you want to satisfy. Obviously, it also has to be less than one. That's that's clear. But uh, uh, this is where you kind of um, will get. And, and, and if you solve this problem, as is in the handout, you will get that uh, d should be greater than r plus delta r, or should be less than r minus delta r. Meaning, if you're 200 and delta r is 3. If you're slightly more than 203 or slightly less than 197, you are good. It, it's stable, becomes stable, right? So, so that was kind of the idea. And uh, you can take this form, and uh, I think there were one or two who kind of made a nice plot of it. And you can plot your g1, g2 as a function of a variable d. And you know that the stability criteria says that you have to be between 1 and 0, right? And when you make a plot of this quantity, you'll notice that it's, uh, it looks uh, you know, something like that. And uh, where this one was you know, r, this is r plus delta r, and this is r minus delta r. And I think you know that these will be the zeros of this function. When d is equal to this, it will be a zero. And that is, that, that's a zero. And so this part is unstable, and that's where the problem started. You're trying to fix it, so you either go lower or higher, and it can become stable. And then you have these other limits. Obviously, d cannot, you know, distance between the mirrors cannot be less negative, and uh, uh, and the distance. Uh, this will be r1 plus r2. At this point, and so on. So, so that's kind of the whole uh, stability criteria for this problem. And uh, the reason I'm making these uh, exams open book is I expect you to kind of use the results and then if uh, uh, but if you have derived it great that, that's also great so, yeah. uh, any questions on this particular problem so I said most of you understood the problem and uh, uh, I think uh, uh, got pretty much close to the final answer yeah. and the last question uh, was about beam propagation and I, I I uh, uh, think uh, uh, most of you did get it as well. Uh, and, and essentially, it find you're given the omega naught on, on Earth, and your z is Earth to Moon distance, and you want to see how much the beam spreads from Earth to Moon. And then most of you got it. And uh, the last part of it is the intensity question, where uh, you're given a cutoff intensity for uh, uh, damage to human eye, let's say. And then uh, uh, and, and if on the Earth, your uh, intensity is 10 megawatt uh, then so well on the earth your your beam looks like this all of them are zero zero mode of a gaussian so 10 megawatt immediately tells you that's the area under the curve right it's the area under the curve on earth 10 megawatt so that tells you what is the maximum here uh, on earth and then you propagate it over large distance z and out here it kind of is to become something like that. It's not to scale, as you can see. It will be much lower intensity because it has spread out. And uh, what is the I max here? And you you know the omega naught and and such things out there, right? So omega naught at zero and omega naught at z. So something like that, right? And then so intensity is lower because it's over a larger area, but the total area under the curve is still the same. Right? So, and, uh, and then you kind of compare area under the curve in the integral here, you compare with that value and you get it. So I think most of you did approach the problem correctly. So uh, any questions on the exam? Any on the whole of the exam? I just wanted to spend a few minutes talking about the particular problems and we didn't ask you much about, uh, uh, you know, the 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 uh, quality factors and all that. We kind of left that out. Yep. Yes. So the average uh, is twenty point five out of twenty five. That's the average. Uh, if you ask, standard deviation is about four. Max is twenty five and. Uh, uh, all right, you can estimate the min from there. So, is that for you? Is that okay? Yeah. yeah. 
And uh, I've said also that uh, the, there's one, one exam, uh, there's a reasonably strong weightage for your assignments and uh, another prelim and final. So in case you missed a problem, it's not the end of the world. I mean, you have a whole uh, rest of the semester and a uh, uh, number of assignments uh, to make up. If you have done well, great. I mean, continue doing that. <coughs> okay. So, uh, I, 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 what I want to do now uh, for the rest of the class today is uh, uh, um, kind of take stock of where we are in this course and uh, what are the things we uh, are headed towards. Uh, uh, just to look at kind of the um, calendar, if you might, I mean, uh, schedule. We are somewhere around here. Yeah, we are here. Uh, uh, st if, as far as the book goes, we are talking about chapter 8. And I would say that uh, chapters 7 and 8 are kind of the heart of this course. I mean, that's the uh, understanding uh, Einstein AB coefficients. From there, understanding what is the gain spectrum, stimulated <coughs> emission, uh, line shape, uh, and uh, uh, population inversion, all these things. This is kind of the heart of the course, right? I mean, so we are, we are in that. Uh, so, so we are talking really the main ideas ab about a laser and any laser for that matter. I mean, be it a gas laser, semiconductor laser, uh, cascade laser, whichever way you look at it, all these concepts are uh, absolutely general for all lasers. So, so this is one of the, we are at the heart of the course right now. And so we are uh, also spending, uh, I'm going to spend a little bit more time today to finish up the discussion of uh, uh, of, of this, this kind of chapter 8, which is uh, laser oscillations. And after this, we are going to, uh, uh, the topics that we are going to talk about are more uh, uh, for about two classes. The topics we are going to, uh, uh, so, so we are kind of in chapter 8, uh, just to kind of uh, find our coordinates again as to where we are. So Cliff talked about a uh, large part of this chapter already, and I'm going to kind of finish up and kind of summarize again about what, 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 the, what are the core concepts of uh, laser oscillation and amplification. And uh, then we will continue uh, by looking at a few general classes of lasers uh, uh, and uh, a few nice things about lasers, mode locking, Q switching and such things. That will be the next thing uh, after we understand how uh, the basic laser works. Um, and then uh, uh, later on in this course, uh, we will, after looking at general ca characteristics of various kinds of lasers, we're going to look at how do you pump a laser. I mean, that, that was a, always a recurring question. How do you create stimulated, uh, create population inversion? And, uh, you can have electrical injection, you can uh, have optical illumination. So there are all kinds of uh, pumping uh, mechanisms. We're going to talk about that. And then, after we talk about general characteristics of lasers and mechanisms of optical pumping. Uh, we're going to talk, spend quite a bit of time talking about semiconductor lasers, semiconductor based uh, lasers specifically, uh, where we are going to show, go deeper, do a deeper dive into laser oscillation, general characteristics, pumping, looking at it as a special case for laser, and semiconductor laser, which I think uh, I uh, uh, hope you uh, realize that that really uh, underpins most of the communication today, uh, semiconductor lasers, uh, and uh, how fast can you switch them, what is the threshold of a semiconductor laser, and, and so, so on. We're going to look at that. So after the special case, we're going to uh, spend probably um, maybe two or three weeks uh, going even deeper into the physics of the laser, into a little bit more into the classical electromagnetic picture, and also into the quantum theory of a laser towards the end of the course. We're going to do that. Um, so uh, uh, just to kind of uh, realize that we uh, have already invoked quite a bit of uh, classical mechanics in from electromagnetic uh, waves, and we have also invoked some bit of quantum mechanics from the Planck black body radiation sort of picture and Einstein AB coefficients, right? But at this stage, if you look at uh, how our laser, uh, how are we looking at the laser right now, you'll see that all these details of, uh, you know, uh, of the uh, wave propagation, 
of quantum mechanics of the atoms, the nature of atoms are kind of absorbed into a few coefficients, right? I mean, that's, as you see, they're kind of an, we have an effective way of looking at a laser or an effective theory where all the microscopic details have kind of vanished into a few, co few coefficients. That's how, that's the stage we are at, you know, ice, for example, saturation intensity and under. They have a lot of microscopic details buried inside them. But if you are a user of a laser, a designer of a laser, you are not, uh, and you have chosen your materials, those things are locked in. You know, and now we are looking at how does it, you know, what is the threshold, what is the dynamics of it and such things. That's what we're looking at right now, right? So, um, okay, so uh, I'll do a, 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 one of the short summaries. Uh, I want to kind of, uh, you know, because it's after the break, just a, a very quick uh, uh, so, so, sort of summary. Uh, so you have, we are looking at two populations uh, or, you know, atoms with the electrons in two states or two different kinds of atoms, basically uh, two energy states of either atomic or electronic systems. And then uh, uh, what we uh, started out with was uh, there were three potential processes that can take uh, uh, electrons from one state to another. Uh, and the first uh, obviously was the uh, spontaneous emission from A2 to 1, right? The, the, these are the Einstein AB coefficients now. Uh, and then there is a uh, absorption coefficient from 1 to 2 that goes as B1 to 2, right? And the third is the more interesting one, which is uh, uh, for the laser, which is the stimulated emission. And, and that's, again, uh, B2 to 1. Right? So, so those are the three coefficients of the laser. Uh, and uh, your energy separation is H nu between the two states. And uh, that's kind of the central oscillation frequency that we desire for the laser. And I think uh, Cliff already discussed uh, in, 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 uh, with you that uh, uh, you know, based on rate equations and such things, you realize that uh, if you just start with a two-level system, you cannot get it to really laze. You need a third level that's a zero, and you pump from here, and, and you kind of start emptying out states from there with tau two and tau one and all that, and those give you your uh, standard rate equations for getting it to uh, laze and such things. Uh, so, uh, what I want to kind of uh, get towards is, is uh, uh, based on, you know, the analysis of the rate equations and, uh, uh, and, and the realization that, for example, you could relate B12 and B21 to this, right? And this you can directly measure, right? The spontaneous emission lifetime. Uh, or, or essentially, if you just populate state two, uh, it will spontaneously decay into state one when there is no chance of stimulated emission when N2 minus N1 is less, is negative. There's no stimulated emission. Therefore, you can directly measure, you can kind of uh, uh, measure the lifetime of excited states and from there you can ex measure your A to one directly, right? right. So, so, so in some sense, D N2 over DT is minus A to one and two, right? Uh, that's how it decays. And then you have the other terms, uh, which <laughs> one to two bring in states from, uh, uh, let me write this down because this is the, the, the uh, uh, central equation of all, uh, all lasers. Uh, so B12 would be the absorption. Right? You can call it spontaneous absorption or just absorption. And, and that will be proportional to number of one states, right? And then, uh, 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 and then obviously it has, ha has to have something to absorb and that is your, uh, well, from, uh, if you had uh, radiation, you know, light floating around of all frequencies new, of frequency new, all kinds of frequencies, then, then it will be, you know, that radiation light field will be here, right? And then uh, the, the third process would be uh, uh, the stimulated emission, which is B21, stimulated emission, N2 to 1, right? And that's proportional to N2, the starting uh, quality, uh, number, and uh, also proportional to the radiation field that already exists, which is going to stimulate it, right? So that, that was the idea. And that's how Einstein had derived it, but we got a little more special uh, we looked at it a little more uh, specifically because we said that, well, 
uh, I know that the radiation field inside a laser cavity, which, which I have created, is really far from the Planck distribution. It's very far from the, from the black body radiation curve, right? It's, it's, uh, so so uh, in, a, in a normal situation, uh, if I look at the radiation pattern, it has the black body uh, behavior, right? And then you have some atoms that may have, you know, uh, 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 some sort of a line shapes uh, of emission. If the atom is inside a box or whatever, a large box, it may have uh, maybe a line shape of like that. This was the line shape function. Remember the difference between the radiation field and this? They're different, right? So, uh, but in a laser, this is upside down. Uh, this is frequency, uh, meaning uh, in a laser, you don't have black body radiation like that. Your radiation field is very, very sharp. We did a little demo in class. You saw it's very, very sharp spectrum. So your rho is really like a delta function. You can call it some rho at mu naught. That's the frequency at which it lasers times a Dirac delta of nu minus nu naught. You can call it like that. So this is how a laser different from a black body radiation domain. Right? Whereas the line shape really is independent of whether you want to make a laser or not. I mean, the line shape is property of the atoms and, it's, and the cavity. Whether you have pumped it and made it a laser or not, the atoms don't care. Right? So the line shape really stays the same. As, as uh, I mean, I'm kind of zooming in here and looking at this line shape and kind of plotting it out in its, in its uh, taking its form. Right? So uh, uh, essentially the radiation that would be available that you could absorb or emit here, it cannot be just this. You must also take into account the line shape. And this is what the laser folks who developed this after Einstein 20, 30 years had to introduce. You know? And, and, uh, uh, and, and uh, for spontaneous emission, you also must have the line shape. There's, there's no way around. Spontaneous emission, the atoms have to emit into the allowed states, so spontaneous emission should also have the line, st line shape. And essentially what you do is, uh, uh, again, I'm, I'm not doing anything new. This You have done this sort of thing. So you have to integrate everything over d nu, you know, over d nu and integra integrate over d nu. Okay. So, so uh, kind of spectrally resolve uh, the nature of atoms and the nature of the radiation kind of distinguish them. All the details of the atoms are here, of the light is here. So this is the light matter interaction term in some sense and kind of split it into two now. Right? So if you remember, just as a qualitatively, Planck's picture was he just uh, 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 looked at uh, the, 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 the light and not so much the uh, matter. And Einstein looked at nature of matter and not so much light, but now we are kind of doing both of them, we are spectrally resolving both of them, right? And, and that's what led to the laser, really. Uh, okay, so, uh, and, and uh, I think you know that uh, uh, the definition of line shape says that if you integrate over all frequencies, that's just one, that's normalized. So you kind of just get a one here, and these two now uh, depend on the frequencies and all that stuff. Right? So, uh, exactly, I mean, that's something that, I, I, uh, just to, as a reminder, this is a revision. I mean, we are kind of re re recapping what, what was done before, and, uh, uh, and now kind of you look at these and essentially kind of uh, realize that if I inside this cavity now, if I put, uh, uh, put a gain medium, right, then the light that's coming back uh, as it goes across, it, it will really increase in intensity as it does one pass, comes back, increase in intensity again. And now I have two mirrors that have some finite losses, uh, but mostly reflective, but have some finite losses. So uh, as I start pumping the laser, uh, oh, you know, uh, I can pump it optically or electrically, whichever way, and I create stimulated, inver uh, I create population inversion here, and that thing is captured by N2 minus G2 over G1 times N1, that factor. That's, this is your population inversion term, right? That, that, that tells you how are you exciting it, and this is, this is one of the terms that goes into your gain, right? the gain spectrum. So that's one term, population inversion term. And the second term, which takes into account all the other details, is this uh, uh, 
uh, let me write down the full expression. So you have the gain spectrum as a function of frequency. Spectrum, obviously, is frequency result. Uh, and, and that is uh, uh, written as a product. The gain spectrum is uh, written as a product of uh, uh, what you call as a cross section, right? The cross section, uh, uh, a stimulated emission cross section minus uh, G2 over G1 times N1, right? And so uh, that's your uh, optical uh, stimulated emission cross section, and that's your population inversion. And uh, you probably have a, a estimates of these. So stimulated emission cross section is uh, how is it related to microscopic details? Well, you have the spontaneous emission coefficient over 8 pi n squared times uh, g line shape nu. Right? So, so that's how it looks. That's, that's all the details of the gain of the laser, right? And you derive these things. Through, uh, basically, you crank through here, you end up here. And uh, you have orders of magnitude of this, the, the cross section. What are the typical orders of magnitude? It, it's an area. Right? It's an area, uh, one over <coughs> centimeter, or, or sorry, one, not one over, centimeter squared, right? Whereas these are volume densities, so these are one over centimeter cube, and therefore absorption coefficient is in centimeter inverse, or one over centimeter inverse. Right, so just units and all that, uh, the recounting. So uh, again, to summarize, spontaneous emission uh, sits here. Uh, this is the line shape. It sits here. Wavelength of uh, the radiation refractive index of your medium and all that sort of thing sits there, right? And this, uh, I think you saw uh, some high uh, numbers would be of the order of 10 to the power minus 12 centimeters squared would be a very high grain, gain cross section. And more, more like 10 to the power minus 18 or 19 maybe uh, is a little more reasonable. This is extremely high number. I mean, this is kind of the range of things here. Yeah. Uh, if you're looking at a gas laser, typically your N, N2 and N1s, you know, these terms would be of the order of 10 to the power 12, maybe 13 <coughs> per centimeter cube. It could be higher, 15, depends. I mean, if you're looking at a solid state, you have much more atoms per volume and all that, right? So, Depends, right? So those are orders of magnitudes of things here. And, and uh, uh, so from here you can see, for example, if these two other situations, you'd be looking at a one inverse centimeter of gain. Right? One inverse centimeter, right? And, uh, and then, oh, oh, sorry, not gain, but this is kind of the gain coefficient. Right? And where does this enter the picture of the laser? Uh, now if you look at how is the intensity changing as, as I move across a distance z. If I move a distance z, what is the, so intensity now is the number of photons, right? Number of photons uh, times h nu is kind of, you know, that's the intensity. So how does it change in a gain medium? Well, uh, we know that uh, the gain, if there's gain, the number of photons is going to increase, right? And how does it increase? It increases in proportion to what you had, uh, you know, uh, intensity as a function of z. Uh, so in, 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 uh, uh, the gain is proportional to whatever you have here. And then you get uh, gamma naught of z. But let's say the gain medium is uniform. We just write it as a function of frequency. So that's how the intensity is going to increase. right? And from here, uh, 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 you, you, you get that uh, the gain the intensity goes as e to the power of gamma naught of nu times z, right? It exponentially increases. And uh, uh, so, so really, this quantity here is uh, what we call as uh, the gain, because i out by i in is equal to gain, right? So it's the exponential. <coughs> The notation used in your book is g naught is the gain is e to the power gamma naught of z times if your gain medium has a length lg, if the length is lg here, then you know that's what appears. So it's an exponential function of a product of these two quantities here. Does it make sense? I mean, so this thing actually sits in the exponent. So it's a highly nonlinear. Uh, function of that, right? So, 
So, so as you can imagine, if, if the uh, line shape and all w were a certain, you know, there were a certain function and, 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 you know, the exponential of that would be much sharper, as you can imagine, right? So, so the gain, gain spectrum is even sharper than the line shape. So, yeah. So, gain is functional. Uh, right. C and then the other one is functional. Right, so this is kind of the power gain, meaning uh, I intensity after you go through the gain medium over N, right? And, and again, so all of these are gain. So this is the gain coefficient, gamma naught. Uh, but uh, uh, after you do one pass through the gain medium, your total output number of photons or intensity, output intensity is input intensity times E to the power of this thing. Because the Gain is. No, no, but I mean, uh, yeah, sorry, I think I didn't get your question um, then. You, you're saying that gain is a function of frequency and then you write. Um, Thank you. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you. No, that's frequency. Yeah, yeah. Frequency. Not, not Z. Uh, we are not talking about uh, materials that may have non uniform gain. Some do. I mean, and, and we're not getting into that complication at this point, but yeah. All right, uh, and, and uh, uh, so b b based on this, uh, we can kind of go back and say uh, uh, what would be the, so, so again, just to see the whole picture, we have a certain amount of power coming in, which is, you can label it from electrical circuits analogy as a DC input, which is your pumping. Uh, either optical pumping, electrical pumping, in a semiconductor laser, it's a current. You inject a current into the PN diode and it creates the laser. So that's input. And, uh, and then you have a certain P out of the laser, uh, which is uh, uh, now related to this output intensity here. So, so this is output intensity. Actually, it's exactly the same thing. Right? So, and, and, and the uh, uh, um, picture again, and this way we'll come back again, um, multiple times. Is is uh, the analogy is really that uh, you have uh, well, uh, you have a, a bucket, but with a uh, you know little opening here, and you are pumping in energy in form of electrons, holes, whichever way, pumping in energy right, into this bucket, and then there is a certain rate at which it can go out which is determined by R1s and R2s and all these things, right? And, uh, uh, and uh, there is, uh, as a result, uh, um, I, I think you kind of know that you will, if there are two rates, uh, P in and P out, and there's a, so uh, there will be other mechanisms of loss and so on, but there will be a certain steady state power build up here based on the difference of these rates, right? Steady state. And, and so there'll be a, lot more energy stored inside the laser than what's coming out. So, so right, just, and then you're getting a small fraction of it out, and then you, have, you have seen that, and the picture there is the number of photons inside is much larger, but they're going back and forth, colliding with the walls, and every time, maybe 1% leaks out. You know? so, so inside, there is 99 times more power, for example. Right? So, so that's the kind of the picture, which is why then the power, uh, uh, and, and there are always these other leakage mechanisms uh, uh, like heat and so on, that will reduce this threshold, reduce the power and all that. So, and then they also uh, uh, determine the threshold right, of, of the power. Right? So that's one, one, one picture and we're going to, uh, this thing will be discussed multiple times now. I mean, I'm just doing it again here, but uh, we'll discuss it multiple times. Now looking a little bit more into the details of uh, the microscopic processes again. Uh, uh, so, um, or rather, Let's let's finish discussing the entire lasing process and uh, uh, right. Okay, so the gain spectrum was given by that whole quantity there. You know your uh, and cross section times the the uh, inversion threshold, and this is straight out of your book, really. And I think you kind of uh, realize right away that uh, your losses, if you Let's say for a second we neglect the uh, transmission losses through this. I mean, this is just a gain medium for us. We are, there's a certain amount of reflection every time the light enters. There's a little reflection. We're going to let's forget about it for a second, and uh, it's very easy to take into account uh, what uh, uh, are those uh, losses as well. 
But uh, I think you kind of know uh, that the, th how do you find the threshold of any laser? Uh, for example, this situation. So you have a, a, a reflection coefficient R1. Uh, then you go across and get a gain of G inside, right? And that, that G is really e to the power gamma naught at that frequency times the gain, length of the gain medium, right? So loss, gain, then you hit the other meter, loss again, go back again, gain again, right? Times LG, and uh, that's kind of the round trip thing for you. It should be greater than one. Right? It's very simple. No rocket science there. It's very straightforward. If you have any transmission losses inside, you just add them in here, right? no problem. T2, whatever be it, right? So you just add them in there. But let's simplify it and not worry about those things now. And then and, and, and from here, uh, you get right away that uh, uh, gamma naught nu times LG must be greater than or equal to 1 over R1, R2. These are the reflection losses. And uh, taking a natural log on both sides, you get that uh, your gain, uh, there's a certain threshold for gain uh, above which you will get, uh, sorry, there's 2. So you get 2 LG natural log of 1 over R1, R2. So that's your minimum gain determined by all the things on the right side you have chosen for your laser. You bought a mirror with very low reflection coefficient, you're in big trouble, you have to have very high gain material, right? Makes intuitive sense. If you're losing a lot, you must have more gain, otherwise you're not going to achieve this, right? If, if you, the other way to fight it is, 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 is uh, you increase your length over which you have gain, right? But I think that it will have some, so uh, very soon, you, as we start talking about different kinds of lasers, you'll see that there are trade-offs in everything here. You can't just continue increasing your length, there'll be other problems and such things. You know. As you keep losing energy to the sides, to spontaneous emission, we're going to talk about that now a little bit. So, uh, so uh, you know, and, and so on. But this is kind of the threshold for the, for the laser. Right? And you can go back and relate it to your cross section and N2 minus G2 over uh, G1, N1, right? And then you can relate now. If you know cross section, you can take it there, find how much inversion you need, right? Population inversion you need. If you know your population inversion, you can find your what cross section you need and so on. So it's kind of the full, full blown picture of any laser. Now, the uh, normal shape of uh, uh, emission, if you had no cavities, would be like this, right? If you had just a gain medium and you were exciting it, this would be kind of the normal shape of emission. This is where all the light will get emitted. It's kind of the line shape, right? Sorry, not kind of the line shape. Oh, what am I saying? Sorry. Uh, um, yeah, it, it is just, it is that. What did I just say? No. Gain, this is the gain spectrum. We are plotting the gain spectrum here. Gain spectrum of our laser media, of this, of this medium, you know, the gain medium. So uh, you have put in certain atoms or ruby laser or semiconductor, chosen the band gap of the semiconductor, and here's the gain spectrum uh, uh, of, of, of this material. Uh, but the moment you put it inside a cavity, uh, you know that only certain modes are allowed in the cavity now, right? Uh, and, and then you develop these uh, 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 modes which are separated by C over, so, okay, let's sketch this. Here's my gain spectrum. The function of frequency. But the moment I put it inside the cavity now, uh, only these modes are allowed, right? And the separation is C over 2ND, or free spectral range, or FSR, right, delta nu. Uh, and uh, um, uh, also, uh, so this is your gain spectrum, but also you also have a, a, a loss uh, spectrum. And typically, the loss spectrum may have uh, dispersion with frequency, but for simplic simplicity's sake, we are just assuming it to be a constant. So it's much more independent of, of uh, frequency. So that's your loss spectrum, and that's gain. 
uh, and and uh, what would be the units of loss again inverse centimeter i mean all same units right inverse centimeter loss too right and that would depend on uh, r1 r2's reflection coefficients here if you are in some material and you're losing energy into heat of the material electrons collide with atoms and create phonons or vibrations you know. heat defects non radiative recombination site all that sort of thing so they they contribute to loss right? so that part of the energy is uh, 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 not getting into the stimulated emission part of the story right? but uh, essentially so now you, you have this sort of a gain spectrum and I think you have already also discussed with Cliff that gain depends on how much pumping you have obviously it does right how much pumping you have if you have not pumped anything there is no no you know uh, you haven't created population inversion so there's no gain right so right so it depends on how much pump how much you pump it but you also realize that you cannot keep increasing the gain at some point it saturates and that sort of thing so there's gain saturation too right but uh, uh, now uh, I think we you discussed that uh, for example here you have these multiple possible modes uh, I think I should have sketched maybe with a slightly more FSR. Let's do a little more FSR. It's cleaner maybe. Uh, so, oh well, for argument's sake, let's just say there are two. Um, there'll be more, but let's say there are just two. So here's one mode that can laze. There's another mode that can laze, right? But uh, which one will laze here, for example? If this is your <coughs> FSR, which mode will laze? The left one or the right one? What does it depend on? You know, this this. How do you, how would you answer this question? So yeah, I have two possible modes. Here's the gain spectrum. We are first of all, if this is the gain spectrum and this is the loss spectrum, this are we very close to lasing or we are far from lasing? Uh, is the system lasing at this point? Well, uh, no, it's not lasing because then the gain spectrum cannot be like that. What happens to gain as it approaches lasing? Right? The gain spectrum starts I mean the gain reduces and why is that well because uh, you are decreasing n2 minus n1 this is kind of a dynamics of the situation now right I think uh, with Cliff you went through a whole process that let's say there's one photon that made it made it and then you get to the next step it's two and then four you kind of geometric progression right with gain so it increases but essentially if you have a homogeneously broadened uh, line shape here then the whole thing is pulled down as you approach lasing threshold. And uh, at lasing threshold, your gain spectrum would, you know, the, the mode that will laze is the one that has the highest gain. You know, this one has the higher gain than that one, for example. So that's the one that's going to survive in the end. And, and the gain spectrum will kind of come down here. And I think you realize that uh, the gain must become equal to loss at some point for it to laze must equal become equal and we'll see at the end wait we're already very close to the end today uh, that uh, that uh, you know that 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 that's what even though you have a gain of say 5,000 uh, in the end your gain would be 1.05 when you're lazing yeah? because because uh, the the rate equation for uh, number of photons uh, inside the cavity is equal to uh, uh, whatever photons you are generating by spontaneous emission. So let's say you have a certain spontaneous emission cross section, which we already wrote there, times the number of atoms in the second state, uh, uh, times uh, so the r r rate of uh, change of the number of photons inside the cavity, and, and there's a speed speed of light c. So this is your spontaneous emission term, rate at which. Uh, photons are being generated because of uh, spontaneous emission uh, and then the, the because of uh, the stimulated part which is gain it's kind of going back and forth it's all you know the photons are going back and forth so that looks like uh, g g you know every round trip you have two two uh, gain t so this is e to the power gamma right so and you get r1 r2 minus 1 over 2 and D over C is kind of the time it takes for you to uh, so and then there is into does that make sense what I'm doing here so this is spontaneous emission and this is stimulated emission so this is 
and once you reach steady state this has to go to zero to reach steady state once the laser is stable uh, is this clear what I wrote here just to you know uh, I think you guys have uh, probably had a look at this earlier but uh, Oh, sorry, what am I doing here, g square? Um, perhaps I'll, I'll kind of try to rederive it a little bit, but essentially this is your gain uh, every, uh, uh, ins inside laser, and this is your lifetime, photon lifetime inside the cavity, and, uh, uh, or, or for a round trip, and this number tells you uh, how much photons are we uh, gaining by stimulated emission, this is by spontaneous emission, and it's very weird to look at it and say that, well, actually this term, to reach steady state, this must go to zero, and this is always positive. St uh, this spontaneous emission term is always positive. Therefore, this actually should be negative, and, and that's very interesting. So, the, what does that mean? It means that the gain saturation of the gain, there, there must be gain saturation, and we'll see that the gain, uh, as a result, you will get clamped to like 1.05 or something like that. You, know? you may start with gain of 40 or 10 or 5, but in, once you reach steady state, it's going to get clamped here. And that's what I'm trying to kind of indicate, that you may start anywhere here, but in the end, it's going to get clamped right there. So, uh, okay, and, and uh, uh, so there may be multiple modes that may have a chance of lasing, but the one that survives in the end uh, among these all allowed modes is the one that uh, 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 has the highest gain. For example, it's here, and, and the gain spectrum is pulled down and it locks in here, and at that particular mode, your gain is actually, uh, uh, well, okay, you can calculate your gain. And, and this is kind of an effective equation. You can kind of solve it without getting into all details of the laser. You can kind of get it right away. So, so that's very useful. Right? Uh, okay, so um, let me see. So I think I have a, probably a few minutes. Uh, what, what's the time now? I think it, I know that's a little fast, right? So we have like three or four minutes. How much time do we have? Till eleven? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So uh, what I wanted to do was uh, uh, maybe just point out a few things that uh, Cliff has said. This is kind of a more of a review again. So the uh, this is a picture of what is being plotted. This again from your book. So essentially, if you take your laser and you put a detector here. And, and say what's coming out here. I mean, remember the laser is, uh, the laser's stimulated emission beam is going there. But it, there's also st uh, spontaneous emission stuff coming out from the sides. You know? So you cannot stop spontaneous emission. That's kind of the baseline. So you can detect spontaneous emission here. And then what you do is you start pumping your uh, excitation or the in intensity, pumping intensity, you increase it, and you track spontaneous emission. And it's, so spontaneous emission will also increase. And the moment the threshold is reached for lasing, the, there's no further increase in the spontaneous emission. It gets clamped. And all the excess energy of pump now goes into the stimulated emission. So that's, that's the picture. And, and I think that's, that's where uh, that cup falls out directly of these rate equations. And then that's what you did with Cliff. Uh, uh, you can find out your dependence of the number of states, excited states, and two during, you know, when you reach threshold for lasing, N1 is negligible, N2 is very high, so you forget N1, and you're, you get a very simple rate equation that uh, if you're pumping, pumping is captured by a rate at which you populate state N2, you know, so per second, so how, how fast are you populating the state uh, with your pump, and uh, that's R2 naught or R2 zero, and the lifetime of that state is tau. And I think you know that the rate times lifetime is a number, right? And, and uh, the rate at which you pump times the rate at which you lose them is, is the steady state value of that number, right? So, so that's the thing. But it depends on intensity, and it depends on intensity like this. There's a denominator, one plus I nu over I, I saturation. This is the saturation intensity. It's given by photon energy divided by cross-section times the lifetime of that state. So it's kind of all self-consistent in some sense. So as you increase the intensity, the N2 is not really keeping up. It's kind of starting to flatten out, and it's going to saturate if your I becomes much larger than IS. Okay. Now, that's the steady state behavior. What is the time behavior? That's the dynamics. I mean, these are rate equations. So you get an e to the power minus thing. So that this exponential buildup. 
and uh, the time constants are tau 2 divided by 1 plus this i intensity. So the rate is also dependent on the intensity at which you pump and obviously it should be if you think about it right it, it must be uh, also dependent on it and then uh, oh, oh, the upshot of all that is, is you get your amplification uh, and all that. So uh, wait what happened here? Um, okay, so uh, and then here are the plots of the rates, and I think you have what you solved one problem, and we'll have a few more. So uh, in case, uh, okay, so I'm kind of uh, I wanted to talk about amplified spontaneous emission, and uh, uh, finish up maybe in the next class with chapter eight discussion, just to you know uh, uh, look at a laser uh, from a slightly different perspective, and this is again the end of chapter eight in your book. We'll do that on Friday. And uh, we'll finish this topic up and uh, start with different kinds of lasers on uh, next week then. Okay, good. Thank you. Mm -hmm.